Hello, Muntokul. It has been a very interesting start of the week. Welcome back to the latest episode of the podcast. The seventh episode is being recorded on June 7th, 2022. Today, we're talking about all things DeFi. As you can see in front of us, the market had a little bit of an uptick today and then well, the uptick started yesterday and then it died away in the later hours of the afternoon here in Taiwan. So let's check out our DeFi index token and then we'll get into some news. DeFi is currently sitting at $1.11. It is down 11.98% in the last week. When compared to Aave, we can see pretty much it follows everything except what the graph is doing a little bit better. But as usual, if you'd like to do all the comparisons yourself, you can come to the website and have a look at them. We recently had a rebalance on June 1st, so Loopring is back in, our Frax is back out. These are the current constituents of our DeFi ecosystem index token. This is the methodology. This is the last rebalance date on June 1st, as I mentioned before. So let's have a look on Ethereum, right, with the DeFi Llama. So the current TVL volume locked in Ethereum is $68 billion. The change in the last 24 hours has been 2%. Maker DAO's dominance is 13.88%. Curve number two, pretty much as you can see, red everywhere for the last one day, seven days, and one month. Uh, down multiple percents. A uh, Rackus Financer, we talked about this on previous podcast, is the only one that is up in the seven, last seven weeks change of 4.59% in the last one month change 107%. Iron Bank IB up 30% in the last month. Otherwise, when it comes to the top 20 projects, everyone else is down with the exception of Frex, though Frex is up 3.42% in the last one week. Okay, so that is Ethereum, that is the Ethereum ecosystem or DeFi as you would like to call it. So as today, if you are not used to this, what we do is we go through all the news with regards to the constituents, starting with Chainlink and ending with Loopring V2. So the first piece of news today is, I don't know if you guys saw this, that Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, will be at this Chainlink SmartCon. I'm not going to be there, of course, I'm in Taiwan. So he is a Chainlink advisor, and so he is going to be there and he's going to be speaking, as well as Sergey Nazarov, of course, who is the co-founder of Chainlink, Ed Felton, uh, Dalia Malki, Chainlink Labs, and Ari Jules, Chainlink Labs. So all these people will be here. If you're interested in heading out, right, there are all the options over here. Today's story is not going to focus on this, but this is just something I want to highlight. So happening on September 20th to 29th of this year, it's going to be in New York City and online. So if you're a fan of Chainlink, if you're a fan of, of Oracles, and they have a lot of really cool research, a lot of stuff going on, you can have a look into this. If you can make it right online, stuff is getting better and better. So this is something for you to consider as well. Okay, let's get into the news that I really want to talk about, which is the idea of proof of reserves. I published on November 30th of 2020, but updated very recently, right, within the frame of this podcast. The global financial system commonly operates in an under-collateralized and highly opaque manner, creating systemic risks that can result in boom and bust cycles. Proof of reserves is just one simple example. It's the ability to replace a one-year audit process that has historically failed society, whether it's through Enron or Wirecard or any number of other examples, that one year auditing process where everybody's buddies with the auditors and the auditors missed something or didn't see something or you know were somehow had a, having a conflict of interest. That one year audit window, I gotta tell you, if you give people a choice between a one year audit and, and a one second audit, automatic audit with cryptographic truth, proving every single thing that was audited and that the, the place where it came from proved that the, that the assets were there, that they were at a certain value, that they were in a certain state. I don't know a single person who's going to tell you, you know, I'd like a one-year audit. I'd like a year of risk. Give me a year. I'd, I'd like to take risk for a year. Nobody will want that. Everyone will want automated cryptographic truth-based audits. And you already see that from the organizations that understand how cryptographic truth can allow them to provide better guarantees. Now, once again, that's initially crypto firms, certain fintechs, right? Certain CFI. But the fundamental kind of proof and cryptographic truth benefit compared to, to other things is, is just, you know, hundred, hundreds of times better. 
and, and, and everybody can verify it. In our proof of reserve schemes, everybody can verify the assets that certain stable coins have in bank accounts, in gold vaults, on, on a block by block basis. So block by block, you know what's backing a stable coin because it was proven to you by a data source that you know shows that. And what does that do? That makes it so that if anybody wants to under collateralize that stable coin, what do they know? They know that they will be discovered within 10 seconds. That's not a year. You can't, you know, you can't take some money and hope to put it back in 10 seconds. It's 10 seconds. That's um, another example of a difference. and market-wide failures. Decentralized finance provides an alternative by offering highly transparent, trust-minimized financial products that are powered by deterministic smart contracts and cryptographic truth. With the growth of DeFi comes an increased demand for new collateral types that extend beyond native on-chain assets, including cross-chain tokens, fiat-backed stablecoins, tokenized real-world assets, and more. So what is proof of reserve? Proof of reserve traditionally refers to the business that hold cryptocurrency creating public attestations regarding their reserves to prove their solvency to the depositors by an independent order. So this, what this refers to is right, is the idea of uh, USDT where somebody can go and say, hey, Tether has X amount of billion dollars of assets. This is the real value that we've audited. But of course, we only have Tether's opinion, kind of, to sort of believe. And this also goes to the idea of Terra Luna, right? When they crashed, the backing of the Luna ecosystem, right? With the Luna Foundation Guard and the backing of UST is not what we thought it was. As these audits are commonly done by a centralized third party, they can be a lengthy, time-consuming and require manual processing. As developers continue to build increasingly sophisticated financial products in the digital asset ecosystem, a reliable, transparent, and decentralized standard is required to enable reserves to be audited using an automated process, leveraging the superior transparency of blockchains, smart contracts, and articles. Enter Chainlink POR proof of reserves. Chainlink proof of reserves provides smart contracts with the data needed to calculate the true collateralization of any on-chain asset backed by off-chain or cross-chain reserves. So this is the key point. We know that a lot of stablecoins they are backed by cryptocurrency in some states. They are backed by cryptocurrency in some sense, and they're backed by sometimes cash reserves or bonds or treasury bonds or whatever you want to call it. So this allows smart contracts to calculate the true collateralization. So if you can imagine logging on to the USDT website or the USDC website or the UXD, right? We had UXD on, and you can see via Chainlink Oracle what is their collateralization at the moment that you are looking at it, which would be pretty awesome. So this is a fairly lengthy blog post. We are not going to read this today because it would take a very long time, but very cool, very interesting. I think this is something that could be used to solve a lot of issues when it comes to stable coins, a lot of issues when it comes to confidence in stable coins, because people always worry about UST Luna happening again. If you're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, people always reference it. Ah, this is going to be another Luna or Reddit, right? This is just going to be another Luna 2.0. People talk about Tron like this in a sense, because people believe that Tron has released their own algorithmic stablecoin, which is the same sort of system that caused Luna uh, and UST to crash. Maybe Tron's got it right. We don't know, but maybe using some sort of mechanism like proof of reserve can give people confidence or at least understand what is the collateralization rate that trans stablecoin is using. Okay, well, let's go on to the next piece of news. The next piece of news is, of course, is about the graph. And if you've looked at these past podcasts, you know we've talked about the graph and the graph day and the graph hackathon, which happened this month. So one of the cool things I wanted to highlight today is the hackathon where they released like all these cool projects. And we have Mini Utopia as a multi-chain NFT ecosystem where users create. Let's have a look at this. Mini Utopia is the multi-chain NFT ecosystem where users create, stake, trade, swap NFTs with also a governing token, which will have utilizations, which involve farming and insurance. Okay, interesting. PRNTS, Gitcoin for independent music artists. Let's have a look what this is. A lack of Web3 tools for independent artists to build and monetize their following. This has been something that I've followed on social media as well, is that people have said, right, you know, looking at Spotify, looking at Amazon Music, looking at other sort of music platforms, they don't pay artists a lot. And people have said, if you have a decent following, you can use crypto at the moment to monetize your music. So you can, I mean, 
like super rich. There was, I remember it's a very famous artist and she was on TikTok and she said that, hey, I just want to release this music, my music. But her label said, no, you can't release this because we're waiting for the ideal social moment for that, which is a shame, right? Because some artists, they're really passionate about music and to be stopped by their label just sucks. The idea that people have mentioned is that you have two choices as an artist, right? If you're really good or, or if you're semi-good, but you have a passionate following, right? And there are loads of indie artists who are like this. They can just release music and use crypto and NFTs to say, okay, support me. And they can have a very comfortable life, right? They can have a nice house. They can save for retirement. They can keep doing music, go around and play stuff. And I think this is where like this idea of peer NTS, this is where it can succeed. Okay, and let's move on. So there are a lot of projects here. If you're interested, have a look. There's some interesting stuff that people have done with the graph and with what the graph does. Like you can see here, if you're looking at the top of the screen, right? 25K for Celo, 25K for Nier, 25K for Coinbase. These are all the sponsor prices available. So lots of money for sponsoring all sorts of different stuff. The next thing I want to talk about is Lido Finance or Liquid Staked Ethereum. They are very interesting, right? You can see $7.6 billion staked, or this is Lido's TVL. At the staked with Lido, it's in 4,118,206, 64,000 unique depositors. The current staked, you know, APR or the current staking APR is 4.11%. So this is going down, of course, because we are supposed to be moving into the merge come August. They've deployed stuff on test nets. Despite that, Ethereum's price is not doing fantastic at the moment. Don't even know if the price will pick up. Again, not financial advice come August. So Lido's share of staked Ethereum, 32.17%. Lido's F2 deposits, 14%. Okay, interesting. Share of deposits, Lido Anchor. So Lido is blue. It has the largest. The second largest looks like Rocket Pool. Okay. Staking deposits, again, Lido is the largest. And who is the pink? The pink is CRF 2.0. I have no idea what that is. Lido deposits, rocket pool deposits to Lido. Uh, Lido unique deposit is cumulative. So in April, just you've just seen that exponential curve of depositors. Lido cumulative deposits, again, increasing as uh, miners like myself choose Lido to deposit, which I wish I had done before. Lido unique deposits. Again, this is all exponential. Lido deposit the value distribution. Okay, $1, $32, $32,000, 1 million. Ah, this is the money. Okay. And Lido submitted. Lido F2 deposits. Lido staked versus Lido imbalance amplified. Staked F on exchanges. So, oh, this graph is so small. It's impossible to read. Stake F on curve. Staked F on one inch. Stake that on Uniswap V2, stake the F on Paraswap. I Ava V2, stake that allocated. So lots of interesting stats via this Lido's official Dune dashboard. I got this from their Twitter, so you can have a look for it. But as usual as well, all the links for today's stuff that we talk about and stuff that I look at is in the show notes. Uh, let's move on to another interesting story, which is Uniswap V3. So Uniswap V3 returns more fees for passive LPs. This talks about the history of Uniswap. It says Uniswap V3 positions outperform comparable Uniswap V2 positions by an average of 54%, which is impressive. I would define non-rebalancing returns as those coming from full range V3 positions and concentrated positions on range bound stablecoin pairs that do not require position modifications by liquidity providers. So liquidity providers are people, right, who provide liquidity. And for those of you who have never done this, who are new to it, is you go to Uniswap and you write, you're, I have a USDT and USDC, you deposit it in Uniswap, you earn fees based on the trades. And basically what this says is you are earning more money on V3 than compared to V2, which is pretty impressive. Uh, Uniswap V3 introduced the concept of concentrated liquidity, which allows LPs to determine the price range in which they provide liquidity and also give them the option to rebalance positions if a token's price moves outside of their liquidity range. Uniswap V3 increases capital efficiency. Uniswap V3 increases capital efficiency by up to 4,000x for LPs, right? So capital efficiency, right, is, is one of the goals of DeFi, right? To use your money as efficiently as possible without slippage or without losses, without anything else like that. 
as we published last month, provides much deeper market depth in popular token pairs than leading centralized exchanges like Binance and Coinbase. So this goes to our head of research's this sort of theory that Uniswap is evolving from a DEX into something else. Since the launch of V3, there have been debate about whether V3 fee returns that are passive, non-rebalancing, are lower than V2 returns, which do not allow rebalancing. While this is true for some pairs, the data shows that the fee returns from the majority of non-rebalancing V3 positions still outperform their counterparts. So this is the majority, so not all of them. 100 basis point fee tier full range V3 positions outperform V2 positions by an average of 80%. That is impressive. While there's still more research to be done, the results from the study suggest that it is usually best for liquidity providers to de deploy in V3, regardless of how active they are in managing their liquidity positions. So you should be using Uniswap V3 if you can. If you can't, I understand, but V3 definitely seems like the way to go for people. Okay, really cool, really interesting, very good for Uniswap. Uh, it's good to see that despite Uniswap like not really innovating in a big way that they're still doing big things when it comes to DeFi. All right, let's talk about the next piece of news. This is smaller. This is about Maker. A side piece of news about Maker. You probably would have seen this in the last like week or two weeks where the founder of Maker is like looking to revitalize the Maker ecosystem. And he proposed some very drastic changes. This is outside of the scope of today's news, but it's still very pertinent to somebody or to you guys if you're interested in Maker. But today's news is more nice, it's more interesting. It's more relaxed. Megadot presents nature, a collection of popes. Every living ecosystem begins with a single particle of life, the, the connection to DeFi. With dedication and effort, a small city can develop into a forest and flourish over time. So these are pretty cool. So if you've done stuff with Maker or if you have a vault, you get to claim one of these. So I like this, the oldest living organism on Earth. The colony of quaking aspen trees is considered the oldest living organism in the world. It represents your Maker vault with more than one year of life and all the die it brought to life since the vault has opened. Okay, so it says you place your address in here and you can check. There's the artist Ryan Koopmans, which is cool. Um, lots of popes or NFTs so really credit the artist. And this talks about the trees. So yeah, if you want a free pope, right? Before May 31st, 2022, if you generate any die before that, you get to claim a pope, which is nice. Who doesn't like free cool art and this this is pretty cool. And especially if you're an environmental person and you care about the earth and everyone should care about the earth. The world is not doing great. It is boiling hot or heavy rain or drought somewhere in the world. Okay, that is it for Maker's News. Very nice, very positive. It's going to bring a smile to your face. Okay, let's move on to next piece of news. So Abe had an event in London and they had a bunch of famous people, including Stanley Kulichov. So this is some of the stuff. Own your keys, own your assets. The same should apply to social media. That is why we built Lens Protocol. This is, of course, is Aave's next generation social network that they're developing. Connection with real people. Events like these are undervalued where we do so much online. Chris Taylor. No one is an expert in Web3. We all come with different levels of curiosity, trying to build a better future whilst fixing our mistakes from the past. Web3 makes it easier to go from ideas to experience. Seth. Censorship on Instagram is shocking. Web3 is about taking back control from Zuckerberg and the galleries. It was so much fun meeting you all in London last night. We hope you made sure to claim your Pope. If you want to be on the bleeding edge of Web3 innovation, check out our open roles. So if you want to work at Aave, very cool. Lots of events happening, particularly in Europe and America. In Asia, we're still locked down, still relatively safe in a sense. But I imagine things towards the end of this year will start to open up more in Taiwan, uh, China, Japan, Korea, Thailand, that sort of stuff. Okay, let's move on to the next piece of news, which is SNX Weave. SNX Weave have released their weekly recap. Now, this post contains a recap of news, projects, and important updates from the Spartan Council and co contributors, as well as the Grants Council and Ambassador Council from last week. All right, so let's look at some of these stuff. Among the SIPs we discussed last week, SIPs 239, so SIPs is synthetics improvement proposal and 240 will also be included in the upcoming Russell Haig release. SIP 239 which recovers unallocated liquidation rewards due to the initialization issue caused by SIP 148 is complete and has been approved with all eight council members voting in favor. This talks about optimism as well. I checked I, I did not get any optimism tokens. Uh, some people did. I could remind my wife to check as well. Of the 9 million OP tokens that have been granted to synthetics, this SIP proposes using 
4 million over six months for incentives towards an SNX USD pool on optimism. 3 million for SUSD liquidity and bridge incentives for SUSD with one of the synthetics bridge partners. And 2 million to hold for potential builders grants, trading rewards or other unforeseen incentives needed to bootstrap usage and optimism over the course of three to six months. This portion of the allocation is to be held by the Treasury Council with the voting power delegated to the ambassadors until it is spent for incentives. Okay. In Grants Council updates, Mike suggested the possibility of participating in the ETH New York Hackathon at the end of June. That's pretty soon. Big Penny will do some initial research on this and come back next week to develop the Council's approach to a possible sponsorship similar to that of India Hackathon. Okay. Podcast is also now on YouTube, so you can check out SNX's YouTube as well. Anchor as well. So I believe if it's on Anchor, you can also find it on Google Podcasts, which is something that you guys can listen to. All right, let's move on to the last piece of news. The last piece of news today is introducing a Loopring Community Creator Grants. A Loopring is just been all over the place. You should definitely join their Discord because they're always announcing stuff. They're always announcing new things. Basically, they're giving some Loopring to people who have done some stuff. These are the projects themselves, the Lex Explorer, the Puzzle Gang. Let's check some of these out since we have a little bit of time. Welcome to the Puzzle Gang. Forever and always be a good fella. The Puzzle Gang is a collective creating challenges, puzzles, and games with one reward, a tasty Loopring red packet. Right? Red packet is like in Chinese Hongbao, how it all started. This explains. I wish there was more on this website to explain it, but cool. Uh, Looper likes. I'd imagine this is some sort of NFT stuff as well. Oh, Looper likes. Loop head. Uh, this is a fan made site for all things Loop heads from the Moody Brain NFT collection. So Loopring gave out some NFTs. So I guess this sort of explains them. Like an NFT rarity showcaser or something like that. Let's look at one more Loop Mint Shop. Oh, batch minting tool on Loopring L2. We don't need to explain what that is. Fix to solving failed NFT mints community code contribution. How can you receive a grant over here? Get involved in the community and get noticed. Join our Discord, Reddit, or tag us on Twitter. Show us your content tools or projects and get involved with other community members and we will notice you, right? So this is fantastic. This is one of the cool things about crypto, where as traditional finance, if you go into the bank and say, hey, bank, I figured out how to solve this issue for you. They're like, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. But in crypto, right? There is very much a chance for be it in an NFT project or a project like Rupin where you can do stuff, you can contribute and you might get a job, you might get some money, you might get recognized, you might be able to build yourself a resume. I have a friend who's doing a lot of research and he's just landed a job with a big research group that I can't remember what their name is, but yeah, he's getting paid money and he's in university making some decent money while being passionate and enjoying crypto, which is fantastic. So, you know, never discount what you could contribute to a project, right? There are going to be opportunities for you to contribute with a moon in the future. So please keep an eye out for that. So this is today's podcast, or this might be up today if I'm very lucky because I have to go to bed late today. It might not be up today. We'll see. But as usual, at the latest, it'll be up Wednesday. This week, Friday morning, I have a podcast with Archie from Adam Knight. He's there doing an enterprise blockchain platform of some very cool stuff. They were referred to me by my manager, Tyler, or Eth Tyler, as you know, on Discord and Telegram and Twitter. Um, he has the cool board ABR Club picture. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's news. Lots of news, lots of interesting stuff going on. People are still building. People are still going to events despite the bear market. Hold strong, guys. Don't worry. We'll get through it. And I will see you guys this week, Friday. Bye, guys.